Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We will now have the blessing and dedication of a new instrument. This instrument is dedicated to those who have come before us upon whose shoulders we stand. Soli Deo Gloria. Glory be to God alone. Gracious God, your people worship you with many voices and sounds in times of joy and sorrow. Move us to express the wonder, the power, and the glory of your creation in the music we make and in the songs we sing. Praise him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with strength and light. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the fire and the heart. O Lord, before whose throne trumpets sound and saints and angels sing the songs of Moses and the Lamb, Accept this organ for the worship of your temple, that with the voice of music we may proclaim your praise and tell it abroad through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We dedicate this pipe organ in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Scott, Bishop of the Church of God, on behalf of the clergy and people of the Diocese of Utah, we present to you Elizabeth Ann Brooks Harden to be ordained a priest in Christ's Holy Catholic Church. Has she been selected in accordance with the canons of this church, and do you believe her manner of life to be suitable to the exercise of this ministry? We certify, we certify to you that she has satisfied the requirements of the canons, and we believe her to be qualified for this order. Now, Elizabeth, will you be loyal to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of Christ as this church has received them? And will you, in accordance with the canons of this church, obey your bishop and other ministers who may have authority over you and your work? Now, dear friends in Christ, you know the importance of this ministry and the weight of your responsibility in presenting Elizabeth for ordination to the sacred priesthood. Therefore, if any of you know any impediment or crime because of which we should not proceed, come forward now and make it known. Is it your will that Elizabeth be ordained a priest? It is. Will you uphold her in this ministry? We will. And in peace, let us pray to the Lord. God the Father. of God, that it may be filled with truth and love, and may be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all members 
of your church in their vocation and ministry, that they may serve you in a true and godly life, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be filled with your love, may hunger for truth, and may thirst after righteousness, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Elizabeth, chosen priest in your church, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That she may faithfully fulfill the duties of this ministry, build up your church, and glorify your name, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit she may be sustained and encouraged to persevere to the end, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For her family, that they may be adorned with all Christian virtues, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease and that all may be as one as you and the Father are one, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For a blessing upon all human labor and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all those who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all those who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died in the communion of your church, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, O Lord our God. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual work in your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
a reading from Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace 
will be with you. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to the people, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now I am assuming that this microphone is not on. It's on. Well, see, I've got the one in my pocket on as well. So, <clears throat> so if you can't hear me, um, then maybe we need three mics. <clears throat> well, let me um, first say thank you all for being here today and for the clergy. Uh, it's all so important when the fellow clergy arrive for an ordination. It means so very much to, I know the person being ordained, having been ordained three times myself, you know, um, and, and certainly to the bishop it means a lot and to the members of the congregation it means the world. Uh, because we are a connected church and your presence here demonstrates that connection that this this congregation does not exist by itself, and your presence here makes that a reality for, for them and for all of us, truly. So thank you so very much. And, and to Bishop Singh and his wife, Rosha, uh, they are uh, hosting us uh, while Amy and I have traveled from Utah to be here, and it's, uh, you should know that, that Bishop Singh and I are, are very good friends. Uh, he, he and I endeavor to always stay in the same cabin uh, at the House of Bishops meetings. Um, 
And so we all we all do make it a point to to do that. And so actually, in the uh, parish hall there before the service, one person came up to me and said, "The two of you should stop giggling," <laughs> because you know really that giggling is really not bishop-like. You know what? what? <laughs> Bishop shouldn't be giggling, I, I guess, you know, but, but, but there you go. And so um, to Elizabeth now, um, Elizabeth, you should know, and I said this earlier to Bill, the, the senior warden, um, you should know that the Commission on Ministry uh, in the Diocese of Utah is still lamenting and very unhappy um, that you are here and not in Utah. Um, in fact, I heard it just the other day, and I'm getting darn tired of hearing it, too, you know. Uh, they're, they're so sad, uh, and, and so forever, for the rest of my time of being uh, a bishop, uh, you will be the one who got away. <laughs> so please, please know that you are, you are missed. You are missed by the people in Utah. And as I thought about that, uh, Elizabeth, one of the things that struck me uh, was the Apostle Paul. And he have chosen, certainly, from the propers that are offered in the Book of Common Prayer, uh, the reading from Philippians, as well as the Isaiah reading, of course, and the John reading as well, uh, and the Psalm. And one of the verses, or a few of the verses that are in Philippians, um, Paul, Paul writes, uh, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And in many ways, Elizabeth, um, Though you have not been in prison, as Paul was in prison as he wrote in the letter to the Philippians or the people in Philippi, um, you did lose things for the sake of following Christ. Um, you, you lost uh, the friends and family uh, in Utah just as much as Utah lost you. A and you traveled a long ways to, to be here. And like Paul, like Paul, uh, you gained a, a, a new cadre of friends and family here um, who, who care for you and support you. But like Paul, you left home. And I don't think um, the other members of your family have forgiven me yet or ever will, uh, but, but you lost a home. Uh, Prince traveled uh, from India to come to the United States. Um, and in my own life, um, once I followed after what I felt was an internal sense of call, um, I lost my family as I traveled from the state of Washington um, and now have in so many ways become a stranger to my relatives um, because as a priest, for all the sorts of family gatherings that take place, well, you know, those have to be busy times in the church. Um, and so all of life went on um, with that family of mine, and I'm never in any of the photographs. I indeed, indeed, um, in visiting one time a, a couple of years ago, I went to see a relative in the hospital, and after entering the room and, and talking with my uncle, uh, and, and inquiring about him, uh, my cousin came up to me and said, hello, my name is Teresa, who are you? <laughs> um, 
And I said, um, oh, I know who you are. I'm, I'm Scott. And it only dawned on me then that none of them recognized me because it had been so many years. The, the loss, you see, of, of family, Paul experienced. Um, and so in, in certain ways, you have done that as well, to follow after um, Christ and where Christ leads. Because, because when we do that, we no longer belong to ourselves, really. We belong to God. And perhaps that's always the way it is. It's just for some of us, it gets carried out um, more, more intensely, perhaps, or, or, or in a way. And yet we believe, we believe that by following that, that we'll be blessed, which is, say, empowered and strengthened. Um, and that, that somewhere along the way, because of that, uh, that there will be others who will join us, or we will join with others. In the life that, that we experience then, uh, we'll be all the more rich and deep because of following after where Christ leads us, where Jesus takes us. And it has brought you here um, to be with these people, um, to help lead, to guide, and, and to be loved by these people here as well, and who will offer their wisdom and counsel to you as they are strong lay leaders, from what I understand, in this congregation. And so there you are. So Paul wrote... Um, in, in his letter from the verses that are actually the ones that were selected um, that we should be rejoice rejoicing and rejoice here means to fare well um, the word rejoice that's used there actually is used as a greeting like farewell uh, but to fare well to be well because we are well when we are in Christ and we follow after where he um, would lead us. And we give thanks for that. Just as we give thanks for the Holy Eucharist, we give thanks for what, what has happened in our lives be, because of this. And we are promised, we are promised if we do this, that God's peace will be ours. Uh, and that this is a gift. The gift of God's wholeness is the peace of God. Which means, which means that we are joined with God in that. For that is what God's peace is, is to be joined with God. And it is a peace which, as we know, we are told, it surpasses all understanding. So in the midst of turmoil, being joined with God also means finding a deep sense of peace which, by the way, I would say is very important during the time in which we find ourselves living because it is not a time of worldly peace. And so all the more, perhaps, we cleave to God just because to be joined with God is to be in peace. And if we can be at peace in this way, then it really does surpass all understanding. Indeed, surpasses all understanding of those who are not similarly joined to God because they will say, how can you be in peace at a time like this? And yet history shows us over and over and over again that this is so. This is so. In the history of the United States of America, um, one of the groups of people that was terrorized and persecuted um, were the African Americans um, after the Civil War when the season of lynching um, arose. And, and in the midst of that community, um, they continued to go to church. And they sang the songs and they sang the hymns. And, and in the midst of what had to have been a, a, a period of which is uh, filled with fear, um, they somehow found a sense of comfort in that midst in the midst of all of that, as they gathered together in worship, as they sang their praises. Um, so there was, there was 
always in them because of that experience of being together and in church, a sense of God's abiding presence with them, even in the midst of terror. They found God's abiding presence to be with them as they sang those hymns. And as it was said of Jesus, who hung, was hung on a tree in the book of Acts, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. So they hung on trees too. And still in the midst of it, in the midst of it, the families found peace and comfort in the singing of hymns and in being present with God. That peace which surpasses all understanding because as the psalm says, to be with God um, is to be in God's dwelling place. And how lovely it is to be in God's dwelling place for one day in the court of the Lord is better than a thousand elsewhere as we heard in Psalm 84. So Paul then, in the midst of his imprisonment, serves for us as a model. Indeed, he even tells the people, you know, model after me, whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is holy. And true here, true here, um, is actually stated in the negative. If you, if you look at the Greek, it's actually stated in the negative as a form of that, which is to say, that which is visible or not hidden away is the truth that stands. So when you have learned and received all these things then and practiced them, then God's peace is with us. So in the midst of your travels, God's peace is there, and that is the promise that we have. And perhaps the wisdom we gain in all of this life of ours um, is the wisdom of, as Eliot said, humility. For you know that there's so many things which lie outside of our control and so many gracious things that come from God. And so in the face of that, perhaps, that is the only wisdom that there is, is the wisdom of humility. Because humility, as he says, is endless. And now to, to Jesus. Um, Jesus. Jesus talks about being the bread of life. And the bread that they make um, in Israel um, to this very day is, is, is probably exactly the same as was made in Jesus' time. It's usually in, in a loaf about, it's round, and it's about this thick, you see. And they make it, and it's made every day. Uh, and you go down to the stalls and you, you buy this, this loaf of bread. Um, and it is. It's, it's, and it's, it's not really what you call stiff bread at all. Um, and and you, you take it back and you just tear pieces off. Um, it's, it's made that way. It's not made to be cut. It's made to be torn apart, you see. Um, and so you break that bread and then you share that bread uh, with, with your family and your friends and you just pull off pieces like this. Um, just, as, just as Jesus' body was torn, certainly, we tear off these pieces of bread and we share them. And Jesus then makes that claim that he is the bread of life. And as you probably are aware, because um, I know that you've studied in your, your seminary studies the gospel according to St. John, you're probably aware that what is happening there, Elizabeth, is that sense of... of the bread that he speaks about and the life that he speaks about that, that he gives us it is life itself. And the bread that he speaks about that he is, it is bread itself. Uh, and the understanding that is there um, is that our very drive and desire for life and desire for food is nothing more than a desire for him. For he is the true bread, and he is the true life. And the life that is spoken about is not simply drawing breath, but, but it is that life. And that, that's what he promises to you and to me. And he says, most importantly, for I have not come down from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So, doubling back then to Paul, as he lost everything for the sake of Christ, 
so much so that he would say, it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So you, in your way, have made your journey too for the sake of Christ. And my hope would be that because of that, you, like Paul, would understand that deeply. Not you who lives, but Christ who lives in you. For if, if we can embody that, enflesh that, incarnate that, um, then we can be the very best minister and priest for the people whom we are called to serve. Now, the other lesson that you chose, uh, of course, the first one is from Isaiah. Um, And so, again, I keep coming back to this over and over again because as I think of you, that stands out. Um, Whom shall I send? And he stands forth and he says, here am I, send me. Send me. And you come in here to this diocese, to these people, responded to that, send me, send me, I will go. It perhaps is not the first place I would have hoped to have gone, but to follow after you, O Lord, send me, and I will go. And that's what you have done. And now, the people of the congregation, would you stand for me, please? And Elizabeth? So Lisbeth chose the lesson from Isaiah and it says, send me. Um, However, it's never just one person, is it? It's never just one person. So as Isaiah said, send me, and as Elizabeth responded by sending, then send me, O Lord, send me then my prayer and hope for you in this diocese and in this congregation would be send us. Send us to those places where where Christ's presence is needed. Send us to minister to those people that Christ loves deeply, but the world does not. Send us, O Lord, for we are willing to go. And what I understand about you, the people of this congregation, is you have been doing exactly that. So God bless you and thank you. For God sends us out to do God's work in this world. And together, together, I believe that you will do great things together. And by so doing those things, to those people, you will show them that the message that we teach, that God is love and that God loves them, is actually true. God bless you and thank you. And God bless you and thank you, Elizabeth, for following after Jesus. Wherever he asked you to go, you went. Thank you for doing that. God bless you all.
my sister, the church is the family of God, the body of Christ, and the temple of the Holy Spirit. All baptized people are called to make Christ known as Savior and Lord and to share in the renewing of his world. Now you are called to work as a pastor, priest, and teacher together with your bishop and fellow presbyters and to make, take your share in the councils of the church. As a priest, it will be your task to proclaim by word and deed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to fashion your life in accordance with its precepts. You are to love and serve the people among you, whom you work, caring alike for young and old, strong and weak, rich and poor. You are to preach, to declare God's forgiveness to penitent sinners, to pronounce God's blessing, to share in the administration of holy baptism and in the celebration of the mysteries of Christ's body and blood and to perform other ministrations entrusted to you. In all that you do, you are to nourish Christ's people from the riches of his grace and strengthen, strengthen them to glorify God in this life and the life to come. Now my sister, do you believe that you are truly called by God in this church to this priesthood? I believe I am so called. And do you now in the presence of the church commit yourself to this trust and responsibility? I do. Will you respect and be guided by the pastoral direction and leadership of your bishop? I will. Thank you. You're not quite canonically resident yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that will happen rapidly, I assure you. Man. It's a technical <laughs> thing. <yeah. laughs> Stop giggling. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> back on task here. Will you be diligent in the reading and study of the Holy Scriptures and in seeking the knowledge of such things as may make you a stronger and more able minister of Christ? Will you endeavor so to minister the word of God and the sacraments of the new covenant that the reconciling love of Christ may be known and received? I will. Will you undertake to be a faithful pastor to all whom you are called to serve, laboring together with them and with your fellow ministers to build up the family of God? Will you do your best, Elizabeth, to pattern your life and that of your household in accordance with the teachings of Christ so that you may be a wholesome example to your people? I will. Will you persevere in prayer, both in public and in private, asking God's grace both for yourself and for others, offering all your labors to God, to the mediation of Jesus Christ and the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. I will. May the Lord who has given you the will to do these things give you the grace and power to perform them. Thy blessed. 
God and Father of all, we praise you for your infinite love and in calling us to be a holy people in the kingdom of your Son, Jesus, our Lord, who is the image of your eternal and invisible glory, the firstborn among many brethren, the head of the church. We thank you that by his death he has overcome death, and having ascended into heaven, has poured his gifts abundantly upon your people, making some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry and the building up of his body. Therefore, Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, give your Holy Spirit to Elizabeth. Fill her with grace and power and make her a priest in your church. May she exalt you, O Lord, in the midst of your people. Offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to you. Boldly proclaim the gospel of salvation and rightly administer the sacraments of the new covenant. Make her a faithful pastor, a patient teacher and wise counselor. Grant that in all things she may serve without reproach, so that your people may be strengthened and your name glorified in all the world. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Elizabeth, receive this Bible as a sign of the authority given you to preach the word of God and to administer the holy sacraments. Do not forget the trust committed to you as a priest of the church of God. And my brothers and sisters, I present to you Elizabeth, who is, I can guarantee at this moment in time, the newest priest in Christ. <laughs>
Welcome everybody and welcome Bishop Scott and Amy to the Diocese of Rochester. We are so delighted that you are here and this is the demonstration to us that we are one church. Oftentimes we forget that, that we are connected to one another and to have had Elizabeth's process begin in Utah and now um, her ordination to the priesthood being done here and hopefully that technicality of a letter, letters demissory will come from you very soon <laughs> <laughs> so that we can make it official. Uh, we are so grateful for, for your generosity. Please tell uh, the folks who are disappointed that uh, you have sent us a good priest for the church and the church is much bigger than Utah uh, or Rochester. I can tell you that we sent about five priests to other dioceses just over the summer and while it was delightful to feel that we were blessing the larger church, it didn't feel that good all the time. <laughs> so we empathize with, uh, with what your commission on ministry must be feeling but hopefully they will know that uh, Elizabeth is surrounded by a lot of loving people. Look at the clergy who showed up today from different parts of the diocese, the people of St. Luke's, people in the diocese who are present here to remind you that uh, she is surrounded along with her family with a lot of loving people. So thank you again. As a, as a, a sign of welcome to you and Amy, could we invite you to come and stand here, Bishop? And Amy, this is a, a tradition from India, so uh, allow us the joy of sharing it with you to remind you that you are embraced um, even as you have embraced us with your love. We didn't remove the name tag or the price tag. <laughs> Give you more bling. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Let us say thank you. I do also want to take this moment of uh, personal privilege to thank those communities who have accompanied Elizabeth on this journey. Um, just your saying yes, Elizabeth, has surrounded you with many people who have said yes. I'm conscious of Johnny Ross, who was instrumental in accompanying you in your early days when you were discerning, along with uh, the search committee of St. Luke's, as well as the vestry. Would you please stand if you are a part of that community called the search committee or the vestry or both? Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. And ever since Elizabeth came here and started her work as pastoral leader of uh, St. Luke's, we also had a small group accompany her called a circle of support. So there are at least two folks from that circle that are present here. Would you please stand? I know Stan is here and, and Virginia as well. Thank you, and Lynette is not present. Thank you for your support of this wonderful person. And to all of you who are present here in your prayers, uh, through your prayers, as well as your tangible support here uh, at St. Luke's today, we are so grateful. And finally, a word to the family. Thank you, Ian, Henry, and Adelaide for coming all the way to Rochester and making this your home. I promise you we will have snow <laughs> very soon and it'll be fun, especially when you look at it from outside. <laughs> and thank you, Linda and uh, Michael. Uh, Linda is uh, uh, Elizabeth's mother-in-law mother who has made for her a whole set of liturgical vestments because it happens that many of our clergy are pretty tall 
And, uh, and so she has made some custom built vestments for Elizabeth out of great love. And Elizabeth's wearing one of them today. So a lot of love surrounding uh, this coming together of a good day and a holy day for the church. So let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thy own have we given.
as we enter the Eucharist, our greatest expression of thanksgiving, I do want to point out one of the gifts that we have had in Elizabeth's first six months here as a pastoral leader is the presence of a sacramental leader in Patty Collinsborough, who was at this altar celebrating the Eucharist and allowing us to function together as a holy body. We are grateful. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you father almighty creator of heaven and earth through the great shepherd of your flock jesus christ our lord who after his resurrection sent forth his apostles to preach the gospel and to teach all nations and promised to be with them always even to the end of the ages. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death 
we proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in Christ's care and bring us to that heavenly country where with Luke and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep it. for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died and rose for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. This is the table of our Lord and all who are followers of Jesus or do, who desire to follow Jesus are welcome at this table. If for any reason you do not wish to partake, we invite you still to come to the table and cross yourself this way so we can share blessing with you. We are glad you are home.
Let us pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for feeding us with the holy food of the body and blood of your Son and for uniting us through him in the fellowship of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for raising up among us faithful servants for the ministry of your word and sacraments. We pray that Elizabeth may be to us an effective example in word and action, in love and patience, and in holiness of life. Grant that we with her may serve you now and always rejoice in your glory through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Elizabeth, would you bless us, please? Amen. Amen.